Hi everyone, welcome to this first episode of our Found Bright Talk series, which is called Founders Spotlight. My name is Ina Yulo and I'll be moderating today. So for uh, this first episode of this series, we have Devika Wood from Vita Care. Devika is an amazing woman in tech who was also actually at our meet up here at our Bright Talk London offices. So it was very great to meet her there and knew that I wanted her back for more. Uh, just to give you a brief background, so again, my name is Ina Yulo. I am a senior content manager here at Bright Talk. I have a master's in marketing management from Esade Business School in Barcelona. Though I'm originally from Manila, Philippines, I have been living in London for a little over four years now. Um, I'm also on the Women in Fintech Power List, and I'm a mentor at different startup accelerators around the world in both uh, Europe and Asia. I regularly speak and moderate topics. Um, most of these topics are around the, the fintech world, payments, blockchain, and women in tech. Um, if you would like to get in touch, please go ahead and send me a tweet. Um, my Twitter handle is Ina Yulo. Again, aside from me, you know, we'd love for you to get involved in this conversation. There's been over 270 of you who have signed up for this first episode, which is great. Um, however, if you are listening either live or on demand and want to get involved, please send us tweets. All of our Twitter handles are on there. Uh, the hashtag that we'd like you to use is Founders Spotlight. This is a 30-minute session, but we will really want to include you and your questions. So if you have any of those, uh, go ahead and send that through through the questions box. I have a few already um, you know, ready for Devika. Also, uh, check out the attachment section. We have some links to the other upcoming episodes for this series. So again, it's a weekly series here on Bright Talk featuring some of the greatest founders that we have in the different industries. So Devika, off to you. Could you tell us a bit more about Vida, a bit about you, your background, and your journey? Yeah, perfect. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm Devika, founder of Vida. Um, so my background, um, I think, is on the next slide if you guys want to the basically my skill set to get here was um, I did a master's in public health at Imperial. Um, I did two years into my PhD in cancer bio. Um, and I've also worked at um, Google and Babylon and done some health consultancy work in Australia. Um, I never really thought I would get into startups if I'm honest. I didn't think I had the right, uh, well, business and financial acumen, uh, which I perceived was the thing that you needed to get into startups and have your own business. Um, but actually, it all just comes with time and learning and perseverance. Um, I got into um, Vida. Um, it's a very personal story. So I was a carer of my grandma for uh, 12 years. Um, and during those 12 years, we witnessed some very, very disturbing things from her carers that were coming in. Um, we relied heavily on social services to provide us with a carer because we couldn't afford the care ourselves, which cost around £23 per hour. And um, during those 12 years, we had about 150 different carers turn up uh, to our door. Um, so we didn't manage to create relationships with them. They didn't create relationships with my grandma. And on top of that, there was no communication or transparency in the care that was being delivered. So it's fundamentally very flawed. Um, also, along that journey, um, sadly, there was no real um, uh, logging of what medication she was taking or what medication the carers were giving her and what medication me and my mum were giving her. So we ended up over-prescribing her a few uh, medications, especially antipsychotics, which ends up having a massively detrimental impact on her life. Um, and sadly, this is something that has, doesn't happen just to my family. It happens to families everywhere, not only in the UK, but globally. So FIDA was a, a way for me to basically change that industry to um, innovate in the health and social care space, which never has happened before. Um, and our main focus at VIDA is, uh, is twofold. So we've got um, the carer side. So we want to dramatically improve the standards of care. So we want to create a new gold standard of care. Um, this means that we want to upskill our care workforce um, and make them feel valued and remunerate them in the right way so that, so that they provide the best care they possibly can. And on the other side is our technology platform, um, which has three aspects to it. So the dashboard or the full end-to-end -end, um, logistics platform and monitoring platform we've developed um, sits in-house at uh, Visa in the care provider uh, side of things, and our employees use it um, to get the care delivered and monitor all the care that's being delivered. And then we've also got the carer app and the client app that sits inside that interface, so it's all connected to deliver a very seamless and smooth uh, 
um, process. Perfect. So, Davika, one of the first questions I actually had for you is I know that you showed um, some of the, the, the roles that you've had in the past with, with Babylon and with, with Imperial as well. So what made you want to get started in just the medicine field in general? Um, I think I was very inspired by actually seeing my grandma. So obviously at the age of 10, um, it left a very, very lasting impact on me. Um, and actually, I always wanted to be um, a doctor when I was growing up because I saw that um, obviously my grandma was constantly sick and she was in and out of hospitals all the time. And I think I just thought, oh, I can do this. I can become a doctor and um, help people and save people. Um, but actually, when I got into university and I got into do, um, medicine, I um, decided at that moment that instead of doing medicine, I wanted to do cancer biology. I wanted to work in the lab and do research. Um, so that's basically what I got into. Um, but all along kind of the last, I'd say, like nine years, I was working in hospitals. I was constantly doing kind of in clinics. And I got just really inspired by what you can do with technology to really impact a larger scale of people. So I guess what I've done now is merged my two loves, which is um, healthcare and uh, impacting a large group through technology. Oh, great. You know, when you talk about like constant innovation, so the slide that I'm actually on now, I know you talked about um, the platform that you have for Vita, but could you tell us a bit more also about, you know, future plans for where Vita's going to head? Yeah, so um, the idea is to create um, a full end-to-end -end service that can keep our loved ones healthy and um, looked after at home. So for us, the idea was to allow the platform to have um, IoT devices added onto them. So this means that um, when the client or patient is at home, um, not only are we tracking the care and the care that's being delivered, we can also use diabetes monitoring toolkits or COPD monitoring toolkits to actually um, track their health um, data on a daily basis. Um, but it actually goes more simpler than that. We can actually have the carers taking blood pressure readings or weight readings, which then can be used by GPs to make better inferred decisions on diagnoses or prescribing of medication. That's really interesting. So do you have uh, partnerships with, I don't know if it's the NHS or any other private hospitals so that this, the, the data, I guess, can be more seamlessly uh, transferred from one party to another? So not at the moment. Uh, we're working a lot with local authorities. So the main target at the moment is working with social services to kind of solve the big problem which we've got, which is the um, obviously solving the care crisis. Um, and then once we've got that platform, which I would consider kind of the bread and butter of our foundations of Vida, um, we're then going to start going to NHS and GP practices and uh, try and see how we can work together. Because obviously data plays a huge part in all of this, but so is yeah. having seamless communication and um, not, not having you know, cracked or flawed um, ways of transferring and sharing that data. So I think it's a big task but it's something that we're kind of ready for in the, in the next year or so. Definitely. Could you, could you share as well a bit about you know, your experience when it comes to the, I know you mentioned this to me before, but the, the bad communication or the really you know, you know, awful lines of communication when you were a carer for your grandmother? Yeah, so um, the, the communication was literally bare minimum. So everything was paper-based. So all the carers would come in and use paper to tell us what they'd been doing. And yeah. there was absolutely no kind of, what would I say, um, coherence on the data they were giving us. So one carer would say, you know, I'd given Sita, which is my grandma's name, a cup of tea at 9 a.m. Um, but there was no continuity in the, in the information they were giving us. That's what I was trying to say. So there was no consistency or continuity. So it meant that one carer might give us a lot of information and the other one would give us nothing, for example. Um, but then on top of that, it was the fact that we didn't know when they were turning up. There was no way to yeah. know if they'd actually been or left. Um, with the medication, you know, we were just having to like find her boxes and, and see what ones had been taken out of the, of the boxes. And that in itself was, you know, worrying because we were basically, like I said, over prescribing her medication. Um, and then on top of that, I mean, no one was really tracking how the care was being delivered or whether the care was actually useful. So we would be telling the social services, you know, 
this carer doesn't seem to be doing anything or um, my grandma doesn't seem to get on with this carer and they didn't do anything with it. And I think a lot of that was to do with the fact there was no evidence about it, maybe. Mm-hmm. They were just relying yeah. on us as um, service users to give them feedback. And I think a lot of the times we can point fingers and get angry at social services and the NHS, etc. but they can only do what they can given often limited amount of information that they do get, especially in social care. So the idea for us is to also empower social services and any local authorities with the information they need to help service users get a better service, basically. Okay, and can, okay, let's let's. I want to dial back a bit and actually ask you. So, how did you, you know, step by step? How did you decide to start Vita? What was the first thing you did? Uh, who helped you along the way, and what was the, mo- the biggest challenge? Um, okay, so going back. So I was actually employed by Hambro Perk, which is a um, sort of an incubator, to come in mm-hmm. as a health uh, health tech expert, um, but also kind of an entrepreneur in residence. So the idea was to come up with my own idea, and then they would back me. Um, so the few of these incubators around, um, I think it's just about finding the right one for you. Um, it was very useful having kind of that expertise and help around me at that moment, because I think a lot of founders struggle in the first six to nine months because, you know, a founder or an entrepreneur, like I said before, doesn't have every single skill set required to start a business. And I think often you need to tap into people around you to actually help you get the business started. And once you've actually got it off the ground, it's easier to then develop your own skill set and you start to learn on the job, basically. Um, So that was a very, very um, important aspect to me launching Vida. Um, They were very, very supportive. They loved the idea. Um, Raising money was never really an issue for us because um, investors get it. Um, Most of our investors have been through it themselves. Um, So they kind of have that emotional tie to it. And I think it's such a big problem that we're trying to solve. I mean, it's massive. It's, um, you know, it's a known industry that is rife with problems. So I think that trying to solve it, people are quite excited to see what can happen from it. Um, and then um, during my actual starting of the business, I think I can just tell you a bit about how I went about it. So sure. I literally, and this sounds really, really old school, but I literally wrote on a piece of paper everything that I wanted to do um, with this business. So I looked at all the different areas that needed improvement. So I basically, um, I sected it out by um, the carers, so what issues were with the carers, um, um, the customers, uh, local authorities, and um, the next of kin, so, you know, family members. And I literally just kept writing lists and lists and lists of where all the problems lay. And then I tried to figure out where that journey, along that whole journey process, what could be influenced or enabled by technology and what required improvements in the human side of it. So then over like the first year that we launched, the idea started to evolve more and more. So we started off basically just providing care. We were a CQC registered care provider. And then as we raised the funds, we managed to build up our tech team in-house. Um, and then the tech team sits alongside the care team and build that technology with in line with what they actually need. So at the moment, the well, before where our tech was de- developed, the care team were using um, software or solutions that were out there that all other care providers use. Um, and we started to notice so many different breakpoints um, from like getting a carer from A to B. There was no logistics software. The road to managing software was really, really archaic. It was built in like the 90s. There was a carer app that we were using that was just, full of bugs and not user-friendly at all, and nothing integrated. So we were using four different types of software to get one carer out to one client, which, as you can imagine, is very time-intensive and very inefficient and very costly for a company. So um, that's how we started to build the technology in our, on our brand and what we actually do today, um, just through essentially kind of doing and learning and then a massive feedback loop that, that went on continuously. No, that that's so interesting, and I think that a lot of the um the pain points that you that you talked about is most especially I think trying to figure out what are the current issues in the industry and which things can we actually um, do something about. And I think you raised a really good point actually with that. You know, which issues can be solved by tech and which need a change in the human behavior? Because I think that a big issue nowadays also is that we think that. 
tech can solve every problem when a lot of that is is very much down to, to culture and behavior. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I'm a firm believer, and I said it from the beginning, that um, this problem is not going to be solved just by technology. So I know there's a few um, software providers out there that have tried to develop the tech in silo, away from actually understanding anything about the day-to-day -day delivery of care. Um, and they neglect the fundamental core of the care industry, which is the carers themselves. It's a yes. human-driven service and a human-led service. And unless we fix that problem, we won't have the carers to actually use that tech. Um, so I think it was really important for us to keep that always at the forefront of our minds, and that's, that's always going to be at the forefront and the, the pinnacle of what we're trying to um, achieve. Yep, definitely agree. So we're about halfway through this session now, and actually we have a good lineup of questions that the audience members have sent in. So um, I'm going to head through a bit of those now. So for those of you who are watching live and still haven't sent your questions in, please go ahead and we'll try to get through them. So the first question I'd like to go over, Devika, uh, this audience member is asking, how did you cope with the scaling issues that many founders seem to have following investments? I know you guys also had a, was it a one million pound seed investment from last year. Yeah, so we've raised in total now, let me get this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bear in mind, as a founder, you raise money and it just goes out. <laughs> I can <laughs> imagine. Yeah. involved with developing a startup is astronomical. And I think you never stop fundraising. So I, I have stopped, I've stopped celebrating my fundraise, but I need to start doing that <laughs> because every little thing is an achievement, right? So um, yes, I think exactly. we've raised um, about £4.5 million. Um, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, but obviously, yeah, like I said, the more you're scaling and the, the more you want to achieve, the higher your cash burn, right? So yeah. it is difficult to get that balance, and we've just found that now. We've just fundraised kind of a pre-series A, and we, we mm -hmm. fundraised just enough for 12 months of runway in line with including the hires that we wanted and where we wanted to be in 12 months. Um, mm -hmm. But, I mean, we found now that, you know, we've hired three new people, we need to move office, and now we're like, okay, so now we need to figure out if we have to move up, if we have to pay more money on the office, and you know, do we have enough money to keep us going? Um, and then the other thing, which is like, you know, money comes out every month, and you don't know where it's coming from. So you've got to be really proactive about how much you're spending. You need to keep on top of it. And I think the importance in that is having a great financial director, which I'm looking for, by the way. <laughs> so, there you go. Yeah. Shout out um, to everyone listening. Yeah. Shout out to any financial directors out there. Uh, next question for you is, um, what is the hardest thing about founding Vita? Was it the integration of the service it provides into the healthcare landscape, or was it developing and managing the app itself? Um, the integration of the service. Um, like I said, developing technology is easy, right? If you have a great team of developers and an amazing C CTO, they're going to develop something that's absolutely amazing, no doubt. That's why there are so many great tech startups out there and continuously evolving. But for us, healthcare and health and social care is an industry and a landscape that is, I would refer to it as like, as if you're grappling with a python every day. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just like, it's an endless sort of fight to get people to change their mindset and think differently because government can be quite um, antiquated and a bit archaic and there's always these kind of, you know, processes and things you have to step through and hoops you have to go through and, you know, 10 different people to get to one answer. So that for me was the hardest thing and I think it's still a challenge but, you know, we're still facing it every day and it's just one battle at a time really. For sure and I think that, I, I think maybe the healthcare space also poses an extra challenge which is that it is a little bit like the, the merging of, of state and, and the private sector. Yeah, 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 exactly. And for us, the private sector is, is, is easy. There's always a demand for it, and obviously they pay for it themselves. Um, exactly. The one sector, and the reason why we're, I'm so passionate about social care and you know making a product that is affordable and, and high quality is because not everyone can afford to pay for care, and my family went through this, and therefore it would be very, very silly of me and not in line with my values and morals if I just made a company that, you know, basically sponged off the private care because I know the private care market is there, I wouldn't be solving a problem. So for me, solving the social care side of things to make sure that care is affordable and accessible to everyone is really in my heart as something that I'm trying to achieve. 
Definitely. And so next question is about expansion. So someone is asking um, if one would want to use this service in South Africa, is it possible? Yeah. No, not yet. <laughs> um, so, um, Fancy not, yourself a trip to Cape Town, maybe. Yeah, I mean, uh, I would definitely like to go to Cape Town. Um, no, so what our plan is, obviously, we've got this amazing um, dashboard. We've got this brilliant brand that we've created, and you know, we've, we're on the way to solving this problem in the UK. The idea is for us to be able to either white label our technology to care providers um, around the world. So South Africa could be one, um, Europe, um, to make sure that you know care is accessible globally because this is a global problem. Um, either that, or you know we can take the Vida brand ourselves and go there. But I think it's really good to ensure that the economy out there has a chance to grow themselves. So I think by giving them our technology and enabling them to provide care the way they want to, I think is something that would be really amazing and a, a dream come true for me. For sure. And so Ashley, there was an, um, another question I had. I know we talked about it at the, at the beginning of this session, but we talked about culture. And within the, the healthcare system, I know that you and I talked about this also briefly during the Women in Tech meetup downstairs, but we talked about, I think, how especially with um, people who are originally from Asia or Africa, the, the taking care of your elders' responsibility is a lot stronger than in the Western world. Yeah, no, exactly. So um, there's a kind of it's a cultural thing where uh, obviously my family, my mum's Indian and my dad's English, and it was a given that my grandma would move in with me when she got sick. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of the times, you know, families maybe don't do that, maybe it's cultural reasons, maybe it's in, in a problem with the fact they don't have the capacity or they're very busy. Um, but yeah, it, it varies, but I think the idea behind what we're trying to do is make sure that families stay connected to their loved ones, we provide them with the care that they need to make sure that their loved ones are safe at home. Um, but I mean, it would, be, it would be great, you know, if everyone had the capacity to look after their loved ones. But again, we're changing, our generations are changing, you know, our, our generation and the family generation are much busier than it was when, you know, my mum and I was growing up. Um, so I think we've got to go with the times and go with the changes, and that's what we're trying to target. For sure, and so talking about, uh, pulling on what you said about changes there, so again, in the, in the last meetup we had, you talked a great deal about how you had to become a business person without a business background. Do you have any tips for anyone out there listening who might have um, you know, the same path as you? Um, yeah, so obviously I didn't think that it was uh, going to be possible for me. I had very kind of low, maybe a low confidence in my abilities or my capabilities, <laughs> um, which I advise now no one to have. Do not take that advice from me. <laughs> Um, don't do what I did. Um, I think it's what I said is, you know, you don't need to have a business background. You don't need to know finances at the back of your hand. You don't need to know how to make a financial model. You don't need to understand a cap table when you're launching a business. You've just got to have a great idea. You've got to have tenacity. You've got to really believe in your idea like, like no one ever would believe in your idea. I mean, you've got to literally eat and breathe and sleep with this thing. Um, and I think just utilize everyone around you. Like I would go onto LinkedIn and, and ask people to meet me for a coffee to get their advice about stuff, and they didn't know me. But you know, <laughs> people are out there. People will help you. Just continue. And they'd come when, hmm? when you did that. When you did that. When you asked people on LinkedIn, because I think people have it's, it's it's almost like that coffee myth, right? People think, oh yeah, you ask someone out for a coffee, but no one actually takes you up on it, and no one actually meets up with you. But did people actually do that for you? Oh my God, yeah, absolutely. Like, it was amazing how many people were willing to impart just 15 minutes of their knowledge and time. Um, maybe they just wanted free coffee, I don't know, but um, <laughs> they, um, they were very, very willing to do it. And also, the other thing is, like, now there are so many events out there, so many networking events. Like, the one I went to, obviously, the one I went to, Bright Talk, and I met you guys. Um, and there's, you know, loads of any sort of event that you want to go to, you can find. And I just think making sure that you do that in the beginning of starting a business. I would go to maybe an event a night for the first like mm -hmm. six months um, just to get out there and meet people and, you know, learn. And I think that's what's really important about when you're on this journey is that you're never going to stop learning. Um, but you should not, you don't have to get everything for a price. You know, people are out there and yeah. tap into that network. And did you, um, did you take any classes, any specific courses like that? Um, no, but <laughs> now I'm actually thinking about taking a class. <laughs> um, two years in, and I'm like, oh, maybe I should learn stuff. 
Um, no, I, I mean, for me, it was, I was very lucky that I had access to kind of people in this incubator that, you know, would help me and stuff. But still, I'm still very kind of not, not that great at understanding cap tables or finances. Like, it's never been my forte. And mm. so probably what I would do is go and get a class in, like, you know, understanding cap tables and shares and EMI. There was all these, like acronyms and things I just didn't get when I was doing this business and I still find really hard to understand but you know put me in a cancer lab and reel off any acronym in that and I get it but obviously I'm not yeah. utilizing that yeah. in my day-to-day -day life so um yeah I would definitely you know go get classes if I like, if I need them now absolutely but there's loads of free stuff online as well I mean you can just google anything now and teach yourself but um yeah I think I would recommend if you feel really if you feel like you're not confident in one aspect, either get it, do a class or make sure you learn it really hard because it will be your biggest downfall if you are underconfident in one aspect. I was just going to say that I think that a lot of the time, like I found in my own career as well, is that the the main reason, like there are there are things for me that I also just cannot get. No matter how much I'm trying, I just can't get it. It's not my forte either. But I yeah. think that sometimes just putting myself into a situation where I have to learn it myself via, uh, via you know, a an online resource, a free class, something like that. The, the the main thing that it actually helps with is just me and my confidence is that then when I'm talking about it, I, I will never be an expert, but at least I can talk more confidently and feel more confident, confidently about the subject. Yeah, exactly. I think it's just being able to talk confidently about something. And if you're in a room with, you know, a bunch of investors or, um, well, actually, yeah, mainly investors, and they start asking you things and you show that you don't know it, I think... That's obviously a massive downfall if you're an entrepreneur and you're yeah. raising money. Um, so just make sure that you become confident in, in the areas that you know would probably trip you up, um, mm -hmm. both in the growth of your company and obviously people having confidence in you as well. Agree. So I have one last question from the audience. This is actually a good one, I think, to end things on. So this person is asking, where do you want Vita to be in the next five years? Ooh, good one. Uh, <laughs> I want to have achieved really cracking the social care market in the UK. Um, that's my kind of real, I'd feel, I'd feel successful when that happens, and I feel accomplished, and I feel like I've really done something and given back. Um, but aside from that, in five years' time, I want Vida to be like a globally recognized brand for delivering outstanding care, um, and also being able to actually take that care um, around the world so that every country has access to that care as well. I think it's just going to be a dream come true to see everyone benefiting from having that support and care that they need. Agree. And sorry, there's one more question that's squeezed in here right before we, we end, if that's okay with you. Um, yep. This audience member is asking, what kinds of things did you worry about that in hindsight you really didn't have to worry about? Uh, you worry about, I would say, uh, people's perception of me. <laughs> this is a really weird one, but literally yeah. I constantly thought that people would be judging me if I was a certain way, that I'd have to change my demeanor and who I was in order to fit in and for mm -hmm. people to respect me. Um, I think I always thought I had to put on a very um, serious and... I call it like a male persona, like uh -huh. because I always thought men got treated with more respect, and I've seen it happen actually in my industry. But actually, no, you have to be yourself. You have to be confident in yourself. Otherwise, we're not changing anything as women founders. Um, we've got to literally shine through and utilize all of our great points as being a woman founder and, and use that to build a great business. So that used to worry me a lot, and now... I realized I spent a lot of time worrying about being a certain way and it was just silly because actually it's got me so much further being myself than I ever thought it would. I agree. And one of the biggest reasons why we wanted you back was because, you know, we saw how you were in the meetup and I was thinking that's someone I would love to have on a more in-depth interview and I want to learn about her life and all the things she's gone through. Oh, thank you. So, yeah, thank you so much again, Devika, for joining us for this first episode of Founder Spotlight. For those of you tuning in, you know, we hope that you enjoyed it. Do check out the other um, episodes we have coming up via that attachment section. Send us some feedback. We'd love to hear what you think and hope you join us again. And thanks again, Devika. Thank you so much, guys. Have a nice week. Thank you. Bye.